This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this morning's Cardiology Grand Rounds. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Keith Ferdinand. He is the Gerald B. S. Barrison Endow Chair in Preventative Cardiology. He's a professor of medicine at Tulane University School of Medicine and the former clinical professor of medicine at Emory. He got his medical degree at Howard University and completed cardiology fellowship at both Howard University and Louisiana State University. He has served on numerous uh, boards uh, and is the past chair of the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, the former chief science officer and chair of the Association of Black Cardiologists, and currently serves on the board of the National Lipid Association and the American Society of Preventative Cardiology. He has conducted numerous trials in hypertension, lipids, cardiometabolic risk, and cardiovascular disease with a special interest or focus in racial and ethnic minorities. He has published over 300 peer-reviewed public uh, articles and has lectured nationally and internationally. He's a recipient of numerous awards, including the American Heart Association, Lewis B. Russell Jr. Memorial Award, the Wenger Award for Medical Leadership from Women Heart, the AHA James B. Herrick Award for Outstanding Achievements in Clinical Cardiology, and most recently, the 2023 Living Legend Honoree by the Center for African and African American Studies at Southern University of New Orleans. Today, Dr. Ferdinand will be speaking on advances in hypertension. Will new drugs and renal nerve denervation eliminate disparities? Welcome, Dr. Ferdinand. Thank you. As you know, I did spend some time in Emory, and I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to talk to so many friends and colleagues. I'm going to discuss hypertension, the most powerful and prevalent of cardiovascular risk factors, but I'll put it in the area of trying to eliminate disparities. And I'll put a lot of emphasis on why that's so important. Here are my disclosures. So we'll discuss very quickly hypertension-related cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, focusing on the African-American population. We'll look at some new and investigational drugs and renal nerve denervation. But most importantly, I'm going to highlight guideline-directed implementation strategies to control hypertension. Here's the problem. If you look for decades, there's been a white-black mortality gap, mainly driven by cardiovascular disease. It actually widened most recently because of the disparate mortality related to COVID-19, and any protective effect of being defined as Hispanic was lost. This white-black mortality gap is mainly driven by cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke. And indeed, in the last one to two years, there's been a suggestion that there's actually been an uptick in cardiovascular mortality in the United States so that these white-black disparities are somewhat baked into the healthcare delivery system. Why hypertension? In this review of the global effect of modifiable risk factors in over 1.5 million persons, 50% women, looking at the various modifiable risk factors, systolic blood pressure, even greater than other conventional risk factors, has the widest population attributable fraction of individual risk. And note in the pink versus the blue, the risk of systolic blood pressure is actually higher as a cause of cardiovascular death in women than in men. In terms of racial ethnic disparities and its effect on outcomes, there's a disparate high rate of end-stage renal disease in the Black population, three times more than what we predicted by population alone. And this not only leads to early disability, these patients are declared disabled by Medicare, but increased costs at 90 to $120,000 per year. Furthermore, when you look at various forms of heart failure, both HEFPEF and HEFREF, hypertension in the goal is the leading cause across populations especially in the African-American population. The concern with hypertension, however, has not just been awareness and treatment. In fact, 
looking at this from the American Heart Association, Heart Facts and Statistics 2024 across various populations, you can see that awareness and treatment is quite high. Where we get into difficulty is control, especially in the African-American population. And the more rigorous, less than 130 over 80, the worse would be the percentages of control. I bring to your attention, if you want to do more reading on this, there's a very nice review led by Modelli along with Yvonne Kamenomensa, and I was the senior author. We did this for Jack in 2021, and we look at many of these issues related to race, ethnicity, the social determinants of health, and give some practical suggestions on how we can adjust these disparities. This is a map of Atlanta. I know Atlanta. I lived there for several years after the catastrophe of Katrina. And the life expectancy from one area to another can be profound. This is a reflection of the social determinants of health, where people work, live, play, and pray. That place matters. And this affects cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, along with infant mortality, maternal mortality, and certain cancers. In this analysis, along with some of my colleagues, from the Tulane School of Public Health, we looked at social, behavioral, and metabolic risk factors to explain these differences in cardiovascular mortality. And what we described is after you adjust for the social determinants of health, you actually, to a large extent, can dissipate some of the differences, some of the black-white differences. And we know that overall, these definitions are social constructs and not true biologic or genetic factors. In fact, in our analysis after adjusting for age, sex, and social behaviors, there's almost no difference between white and black populations. This is a commentary that I wrote for Jack on some of the ERIC data that suggests the idea that low HDL is a potent risk factor and high HDL is protective really does not hold well for any population, but this is especially true of the black population. The artist helped me design a scale on the left-hand side of those factors I think we need to maximize when addressing populations. The social determinants of health, the adverse environment, inadequate health access, low socioeconomic status, low education, food deserts and food swamps, structural inequities, intrinsic bias, uncontrolled risk factors, and today I'm gonna to focus mainly on hypertension. Coronary calcium score, which I think in, increasingly is a non-invasive, low-risk way of identifying patients who we may perceive as intermediate, but actually have underlying atherosclerosis. And lipoprotein little a across all populations, but somewhat disparate in patients of African descent and South Asian descent. On the right-hand side, not putting much weight on the scale of things that I think we should not emphasize, simply looking at skin color or self-identified race, perceiving genetic factors without actually measuring them, and again, not putting undue emphasis on low HDL and high HDL as either being a risk or protective. This particular approach now has been suggested by the American Heart Association as a better means of defining cardiovascular and renal risk. In their PREVENT model, they take the conventional risk factors, they remove race as a defining factor, and suggests that we now look at the social determinants of health, A1C when indicated, and urine albinuria to predict cardiometabolic renal risk. Let's go back to hypertension. This is the blood pressure lowering treatment trialist collaboration, over a million patients. Looking at major cardiovascular events, there's a linear direct relationship between blood pressure lowering with pharmacotherapy and outcomes. I bring your attention to the SPRINT trial, over 9,300 patients, NIH-sponsored, that showed intensive therapy with a goal of less than 120. They actually achieved 123 versus the previous 140, decreased cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, and overall mortality. Here's the problem. In the real world, in this subgroup analysis of patients in SPRINT who had electronic health records available, those persons in the orange, in the intensive group, after 10 years, being in the intensive lowering group was lost, such that in conventional day-to-day -day practice, we have been unable to maintain intensive blood pressure lowering in these patients. 
There is no new guideline. The last from 2017 suggests that most patients will need two or more antihypertensive medicines. And this is especially true in black adults who tend to have more severe and more poorly controlled hypertension. This is from the American Heart Association's scientific statement on resistant hypertension. This was published in 2018. It suggests that first we exclude secondary causes, appropriate therapeutic lifestyle changes, and then optimize three drugs, long-acting RAS blocker, ACE or ARB, long-acting calcium channel blocker, and a thiazide type diuretic. And they specifically suggest that chlorothaladone and endapamide may be more beneficial for blood pressure lowering in these difficult to treat patients than hydrochlorothiazide. Indapamide is available in the United States. It was the thiazide type diuretic used in ASCOT. It is generic, it's long acting, it maintains its effect with moderate renal insufficiency. An important step in the resistant or difficult to treat patient, however, is using a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, either spironolactone or aprilinone. Aprilinone is not as potent as spironolactone. It tends to be taken twice in terms of the milligrams and per day, but it is effective, especially in middle age and older men who want to avoid some of the off-target effects in estrogen stimulation. So why do we have all these patients with resistant hypertension? Well, there are multiple problems that's listed here, but perhaps the main problem is under treatment. We as clinicians just don't use enough medicines we don't intensively increase medicines and use combination therapy to lower blood pressure in these difficult to treat patients. This is the problem in the black population. This is the Jackson Heart Study. I like to call it the Framingham of the South and the Regard Study, a biracial cohort, mainly in the Southeast. And they looked at the underutilization of treatment in black patients with apparent treatment resistant hypertension. Over 1,700 patients, two thirds of whom were female. Very few had ideal lifestyle factors. Less than 6% were taking chlorothaladone or endapamide, despite having resistant hypertension. And less than 10% were using spironolactone or aprilinone, despite the data showing that mineral corticoid receptor antagonism is one of the best means of controlling blood pressure in these difficult to treat patients. Also from the Jackson Heart Study, they looked at plasma endothelin-1. It's a vasoconstrictor, and it appeared to be predictive of new onset hypertension and progression of hypertension in this cohort. So these factors now leads us to discuss the new and emerging agents, excuse the 2S, for difficult to treat hypertension. In the black are those which are investigational. In the red are two classes of agents which are now available, but not specifically for hypertension. The Arnie Sacubutyl Valsartan is effective across a wide range of patients with heart failure. It at first was being investigated as an antihypertensive treatment, and it does have a blood pressure lowering effect. SGLT2 inhibitors were first approved for the treatment of diabetes. We now know they have an effect across a wide range of heart failure and with chronic kidney disease. And I'll show you a study in 150 self-defined African Americans where we were able to robustly lower blood pressure with these particular agents. In the black are a series of investigational agents, a novel HO natriuretic peptide, which is only at phase two, an endothelium receptor antagonist, which is now undergoing phase three studies, an angiotensinogen interfering agent, which blocks the first step of the renin angiotensin system. New aldosterone synthase inhibitors are entering phase three, where we're able to turn off aldosterone. And beyond spironolactone and aprilinone, there are new non steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, which gives the promise of lowering blood pressure, but with perhaps less hyperkalemia and more effect in patients with chronic kidney disease. Let's look at some of the data. The atrial natriuretic peptide is an injectable compound. It's only now in phase two. This is a small sample, 22 patients with a single injection. It showed excellent 24-hour blood pressure reduction and a beneficial effect on various cardiometabolic markers. The dual endothelin antagonist was published in Lancet in 2022, a phase three trial, and it did show effective lowering with apricententin at 12.5 and 25 milligrams, both daytime and nighttime pressure. 
It should be noted that one of the perhaps Achilles tendons of the endothelial antagonist is the tendency to have fluid retention. So these patients are gonna still need robust treatment with diuretics. The renin-angiotensin system has various areas where we're now are approaching the treatment of hypertension. The first step in the renin-angiotensin system is angiotensinogen excreted by the liver. Zilbiceran inhibits the RNA synthesis of angiotensinogen. It is given in an injection and has a very long half-life after original injection of three month follow-up, it then can be given every six months. It's now in phase three studies. From the adrenal gland, we now are able to actually inhibit the synthesis. Batrostat and Rondrostat have recent data and are now in phase three studies. And at the level of mineral corticoid receptor antagonism, we now have agents beyond previous spironolactone and epirulinone. Phenineron is available, but it doesn't appear to have much of a potent blood pressure effect. Some of the newer agents, which are different in their structure, they're called non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonists appear to be more effective than phenineron as antihypertensive agents. Let's look at some of the data. This was just published in February of this year, the RNA interfering agent, Zilbiceran in mild to moderate hypertension in a randomized trial. 24% of them were black patients, 44% women. In this particular study, an injection given at baseline and then three months showed a persistent lowering of the blood pressure compared to placebo. Perhaps one of the benefits of this approach may be to overcome non-adherence, which is a problem in patients taking blood pressure medications. In terms of aldosterone synthase inhibitors, there are two now that have passed phase two. One is Batrostat. This was published in New England Journal of Medicine approximately a year ago. And it shows that two doses, excellent lowering of the blood pressure. And its effect appears to maintain long-term. Also, there was no serious adverse events with these aldosterone synthase inhibitors. A second one, Larandrostat, was published in September of 2023, again, two doses, showing long-term blood pressure lowering, but less hyperkalemia, an uncommon finding with this, finding with this approach to inhibiting aldosterone. So perhaps in the future, aldosterone tintase inhibitors may help control these difficult to treat patients. In terms of spironolactone and pyrolinone, they've been around for decades and they are clearly are effective antihypertensive agents. Venineron is now available, but perhaps less effect on blood pressure. One new one, acidunaron, has been used in Japan and now is being investigated in the United States. I'll show you some data on that new non-steroidal mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. This is a phase 2B study. It's called Block CKD. Again, almost 45% of greater female, 21% defined as Hispanic. Look at the stage of kidney disease, 39.4% stage four kidney disease, one third with diabetes and various forms of albinuria. This particular agent shows systolic blood pressure consistent and meaningful across all of the subgroups, about 10 millimeters of mercury. And despite being a mineral card receptor antagonist, had minimal increases in serum potassium or decreases in the GFR. And the same effect was shown in those patients who self-define as Hispanic or Latino, patients who had GFRs less than 30, and patients who had diabetes or various degrees of proteinuria. So perhaps in the future, we now will have mineral corticoid receptor antagonists that we can use effectively with higher forms of CKD and proteinuria. I mentioned earlier a study with an SGLT2 inhibitor. Implicofosin was used in 150 Black adults with diabetes. And what we reported was implicofosin 10 to 25 milligrams gave a robust blood pressure reduction. In this population, 52% male, mean age 56.8. Note the baseline blood pressures were stage two. You won't see these type of blood pressures in patients who have diabetes and blood pressure is not markedly elevated. The higher the blood pressure, the greater the effect. But using implicofosin and SGLT2 inhibitor in these patients with uncontrolled diabetes and stage two hypertension, 
And the gold standard of 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure, the mean systolic blood pressure was reduced 10.33 millimeters of mercury. When you placebo subtract, it's a very robust 8.5 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure. We also looked at data across 24-hour blood pressure and other populations in this review with Dr. Cario and O'Keefe. And it suggests that SGLT2 inhibitors may be effective regardless of self-definition of race or ethnicity in terms of blood pressure reduction, again, mainly in patients who have higher degrees of blood pressure. I'm gonna make one comment on bariatric surgery since this was just recently reported in JAT. I don't think that this is gonna be a final pathway to treat patients who have severe obesity and hypertension. However, in 100 patients with gastric ruin Y versus medical therapy alone, there was significant reduction in blood pressure with 46.9% reaching remission and a decrease in antihypertensive medications. I somewhat think the authors may have been a little bit energetic in their conclusion. Of course, obesity should be treated, but they suggest that bariatric surgery is an effective and durable strategy to treat hypertension in patients with obesity. I think it's a benefit of bariatric surgery, uh, bariatric surgery but it will not be a primary strategy to treat hypertension in these patients. Let's now move over to renal nerve denervation which has been suggested to be a path forward for treating more difficult to treat patients. For treating more difficult to treat patients. You can hear me? Okay. Um, there are various approaches to renal nerve denervation. One of the approaches has not yet been approved and that's using infusion of alcohol into the adventitia. It will be a late breaker at ACC where you are in Atlanta some of the preliminary data suggests that using alcohol to renal denervate, while it may be safe, is not as effective as the two approved approaches, which I'm going to describe now. One of the approaches uses radio frequency with the simplicity catheter. It was approved by the FDA in November of 2023. The actual approval that was done first, approximately two weeks prior, was using ultrasound with a water-cooled balloon, the radiance catheter. The FDA indication is to reduce blood pressure as adjunctive treatment in hypertensive patients whose lifestyle modifications and antihypertensive medications do not adequately control blood pressure. Now, there's some criticism that the FDA was too generous in this indication and may lead to overuse of this technology. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is that they're not trying to handicap clinicians and suggested that if we do the right thing in terms of lifestyle modification and blood pressure medicines, and in the judgment of the clinician that needs additional therapy, renal nerve denervation may be beneficial. The question is, will this be a tool to address the disparities that we see ongoing? Well, let's look at the labeling. First, for the paradise balloon, ultrasound catheter. The population defined as Black African-American was approximately 20%. And then FDA notes that they noted no safety or effectiveness related differences in the Black populations, meaning that it may be an effective tool. In terms of Hispanic ethnicity, there was not enough data to make any comments on clinical safety and effectiveness, but there's no reason to think that the tool would not work in a person who self-defines as Hispanic. In the simplicity catheter, it's somewhat of a nuanced approach to race ethnicity. No mention is made of the black cohort. In terms of ethnicity, the FDA notes that there was not sufficient numbers to address safety and effectiveness. What's unhidden is that in some of the early studies using the unipolar catheter, the African-American cohort did not have as beneficial effect, and I'll show some reasons why that might be. There is in the label with the spiral catheter that it hasn't been studied in type one, but in type two diabetes, there is no uh, discussion that suggests less effectiveness or safety in that population. They do specifically note, however, in patients with reduced kidney function, those patients have not been studied in the clinical trials, although global registries and the experience in Europe where these catheters have been available do not show any differences in safety and effectiveness with the GFR less than 45. Now, what about the black cohort? This is an analysis that we just published 
with uh, Ray Townsend from Penn, looking at the impact of antihypertensive medications in patients with renal nerve denervation using the spiral catheter in addition to medications. And here's the concern. I bring your attention to the Black Americans in the lower left-hand quadrant. In the sham group, there was a marked increase in medications, such that the blood pressure lower than the sham group, similar to that in the renal denervation group, and it did not reach the statistical significance of blood pressure lowering because of that difference compared to other U.S. patients, patients outside the U.S., and non-Black Americans. You just did not see that same increase. What I think this may be a marker for is the mistrust and distrust that many Black patients have such that when they enter into a study, there's a marked Hawthorne effect. For the first time, attention is paid to their blood pressure and to them as an individual. They start to take their medicine, start to adhere, and start to get a beneficial effect in the sham group, blunting the effect of renal denervation. Indeed, in the future, there may be other uses for renal denervation, which may benefit high-risk patients, including some preliminary evidence showing a benefit in terms of decreasing atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmias, cardiometabolic effects in patients with sleep apnea, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. At the present time, however, it's not going to eliminate the need for effective pharmacotherapy and lifestyle modification, but may simplify therapy by removing one or two blood pressure medicines in patients who have high peel burden. All right. So what we're going to do to overcome these disparities, what's going to be our pathway going forward. I'm proud of the fact that for decades in New Orleans, my wife, Daphne Ferdinand, she's a PhD in nursing and I myself have had the Healthy Heart Community Prevention Project. After some of the pioneering work by the late Elijah Saunders in Baltimore, we would go into the community in various uh, aspects barbershops, beauty shops, churches, screen and educate the community. The Healthy Heart Primary Prevention Project was actually started first as an NIH project in 1994, and it's ongoing. This, of course, is not part of my two-lane work. It's part of my work as a clinician and community member. I'm a native of New Orleans. Community lectures, health screenings. We embrace the need to educate patients on the benefit of vaccines and treatment of diabetes. There's my wife, Daphne, at the top in the middle. Healthy Heart was prescient in that we said that if we're going to approach the community, we need to do it in a multifactorial manner. One of the things we did was a program called Cut Your Pressure, where we used barbershops and hairstylists, salons, as a means of educating and screening patients for hypertension. Give God a hand where we went to church pastors and actually allowed them to receive this message and give it to their congregation on certain Sundays. And then clinical symposium for primary care clinicians, not just talking to academicians, but going to the foot soldiers who actually need to control hypertension and other cardiovascular risk. Here's the website for Healthy Heart if you wanna see more information about that program. The reason it's important, because now we have robust clinical outcomes data published in New England Journal of Medicine and a cluster randomized trial of blood pressure reduction in black barbershops. The first author, Ron Victor, is at Cedar Sinai. The late Ron Victor was at Cedar Sinai. The rest of the story is that Ron Victor is actually from New Orleans, went to Tulane, and consulted with me all the way through this process. He first attempted this in Dallas at UT Southwestern, and then when he transferred to Los Angeles, he was able to show a successful trial. What was his secret sauce? They took black men in South Central LA who had mean blood pressures of 154. They got two thirds of them to get a blood pressure down less than 130 and 89% less than 140 over 90. The barbers did not treat the blood pressure, but it was a trusted site of intervention. The men were comfortable in that particular environment. What I would suggest is that we don't necessarily need to replicate the black barber shop as the source of treatment, but all of our treatment sites should be welcoming to our patients where they feel wanted and it can be trusted. Team-based care. The barbers didn't treat the patient. It was a clinical hypertension pharmacist who integrated care electronically with the Cedar sinai physician. 
and effective antihypertensive drug regimens. Similar to what was suggested by the 2017 guidelines, Dr. Victor started with two drug therapy, a RAS blocker and a long acting calcium channel blocker. He then added endapamide, a thiazide type diuretic, which I mentioned earlier may have a longer and more robust effect than thiaz hydrochlorothiazide. And in the intervention group, in order to get those two thirds of patients less than 130 over 80 from 154, he used aldosterone antagonism. His agent of choice was iprilinone, not as potent as bronolactone, had to be given twice daily and twice the milligrams per day, but he wanted to avoid the off-target effects, especially in this cohort of Black men. A pilot study that we just have published recently out of New Orleans also looks at another path that may help these patients to control their blood pressures using simple text messaging. The name of the study was Text My BP Meds, Healthy Heart combined with a group called LA Cats, an NIH sponsored consortium. Tulane University, the medical students, what we did was give the patients a valid blood pressure device and then have their blood pressures text back to the clinic with text messagings on a daily basis to remind them to adhere, stay on lifestyle modification, and take medicines as ordered. It was published in American Heart Journal Plus. The first author is Daphne Ferdinand. The other authors are medical students and John LaFont, a biostatistician. What we showed was giving the patient a valid device with daily blood pressure reminders and incorporating the family and friends to help support showed a significant decrease in blood pressure from a mean of 142 to 131. They didn't come to clinic. I didn't change medicines. In fact, I was really not that involved in this process. And this was a real cohort of typical New Orleans patients, mean age 58.7, BMI 34, two thirds female, over 90% self-identified as black, one fourth diabetes, 72 obesity. This digital approach may be a leap forward. This is just published in Jack Open this year. They looked at 28 studies over 8,000 patients and showed small decreases, but significant in systolic blood pressure using digital health interventions. The Millions Hearts Program is the overarching program from CDC and other governmental agencies. And they recently have started a hypertension control challenge where they would suggest that we should recognize those champions in the community who were able to lower blood pressure. They chose 140 over 90, perhaps a more easily achievable goal, and they would like to see it getting at least 80% of the population of adults in that population. Our guidelines have become complicated. Um, one of the problems is that we write very excellent evidence-based guidelines, but they're not implemented in usual practice. This is a statement from the American Heart Association, American Medical Association. I was part of the working group. The first author is Marwa Abdullah from Sinai in New York. And what we suggested is that we have to really start to implement guidelines versus writing peer reviewed published documents with multiple citations and very complex algorithms. Here's our central illustration. I'll go around the clock and just make a few comments on some of the key strategies to improve implementation. First, measure blood pressure accurately. For a biomarker that's so potent and so prevalent, we do a poor job of measurement. Secondly, team-based care. Not just the doctor, but also the advanced practice nurse, the registered nurse, the pharmacist, the patient, and the patient's significant others. Physical activity. The artist shows exercise equipment here, but you really don't need to have equipment. Physical activity has been shown to have an excellent effect on the patient's well being. Standardized treatment protocols. We know the data from Kaiser, in which they use a combination of lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide, and other protocols starting with two drugs, similar to Ron Victor's Los Angeles Black Barbershop study, have shown profound blood pressure lowering. Improved medication acceptance and adherence. That only comes with shared decision making and patient education. Quality improvement certification, similar to what the Million Hearts is uh, doing at this time. Financial levers, I would think not to penalize, or you'd have the adverse effect on those populations who have the highest risk and are being treated by clinicians who mean well, 
not actually getting some of the financial benefits of intervening in those high risk patients. And then finally, attacking some of the structural inequities. And I'm gonna make a few comments on that, not in terms of social science, but its real impact on healthcare dollars and healthcare lives. The church approach may actually be very beneficial. This is another collaboration with the School of Public Health out of Tulane in which we did a systematic review and meta-analysis of church-based interventions. And it appears again, small changes, but perhaps significant in large populations in terms of body weight, waist circumference and systolic blood pressure. The idea is that church-based interventions may be effective for reducing cardiovascular risk and health disparities. The proof of this particular concept is ongoing. In New Orleans, we have a study called CHERISH. It's a somewhat tor tortured acronym, Church-Based Health Intervention to Eliminate Racial Inequities in Cardiovascular Health. Sponsored by NIH, we are going into 42 churches using nurse practitioners and community health workers embedded in the church, having many MINI little clinics in the church setting to see if we can bend the curve of uncontrolled risk factors in the black population in New Orleans. This particular study is an implementation science study to see the type of work that Healthy Heart has been doing for years can be generalized and shown to be effective in a large population. I mentioned in the beginning, I was gonna make the case why eliminating these disparities is so important. I published this commentary in Nature Cardiology, and I was asked to comment on eliminating racial and ethnic disparities in the United States. Here's what I say. This persistent mortality gap, the death and disability related to cardiovascular disease increases the healthcare costs. The politicians and pundits say that we spend more per capita in the United States on healthcare, but have the shortest life expectancy. But that really is not true, at least it's simplistic. We spend more because we tend to treat patients with more terminal disease. And we spend more because of these racial and ethnic disparities, recurrent hospitalization for heart failure, end-stage renal disease on dialysis, stroke, the leading cause of disability. So the solution has to be based on evidence-based preventive approaches versus simply treating end-stage patients with complicated and expensive medicines. The last sentence is actually my case that this is a practical imperative because we're wasting healthcare dollars, but it's a moral imperative because it blunts our charge to be an egalitarian society where everyone has access to the best medicine. Here's some multi-level efforts that I would suggest that may help to resolve cardiovascular disparities, and it's not gonna be easy. For our patients, we have to consider their preferences, encourage health-seeking behavior, share decision-making for persons who have English as a second language, offer translation services, and assist patients with medication access and affordability. We as clinicians must recognize we have biases, clinical uncertainty and beliefs. We have stereotypes about our patients, and their inability to change. And we need to address the social determinants of health. The PREVENT model from the American Heart Association says we should measure this. It's not easy to do, although the zip code analysis is embedded in the risk calculator. And for the healthcare system, we need to eliminate uninsured and underinsured status, increase geographical availability of care, have unique means of financing and delivering healthcare, and identify and overcome structural racism within the healthcare system. This is a pyramid that I suggest specifically related to hypertension. Address the social determinants of health. Use therapeutic lifestyle changes, combination therapy in most adults, but especially black adults, and promote self-monitored blood pressure so that the patient can be energized, participate in his or her own healthcare, specifically as it relates to lowering blood pressure. The 15-minute di di uh, visit designed by the business persons who now run healthcare was made up out of whole cloth, and it really does not give us adequate time to address to these social determinants of health. This is not just my opinion. This is a recent editorial from Ferros, the AOA magazine, that suggests it's time that we look 
more vigorously at the 15 minute visit and recognize multiple concerns, including profit driven health care, not adhering to standards of care, not having adequate time to deal with patients' needs, and removing the physician from the distinct human interaction of being a clinician. At the top is a quote from Francis Peabody from 1906, which I think we all should adhere to one of the essentials of humanity and the secret of care for the patient is caring for the patient. The 15 minute visit often leads clinicians to spend more time treating the chart than treating the patient. What I suggest we do, and this is a patient who allows me to use his picture, is that we sit down eye level, culturally appropriate, literacy appropriate level, conversations with our patients, slow down, avoid jargon, use pictures and models and a show me technique and encourage our patients to ask questions. So region health equity needs targeted interventions to eliminate these disparities based on race, ethnicity, sex, gender, geography, socioeconomic status, ability and disability. And as I said in the beginning, it is a moral and a practical imperative. Thank you very much. Hopefully we have time for a few questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Ferdinand. That was uh, amazing. And just what I expected, knowing uh, how wonderful your presentations are, uh, learned a lot of new information. Um, and uh, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I'll start with uh, Dr. Sperling, who made a comment. Uh, Dr. Sperling, would you like to unmute and uh, make your comment? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, Keith, um, friend, champion, and leader, um, just thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, your comments are always so critically important. I learn a lot each time I, I listen to you. Um, you know, I guess my, my comment would be, we, we know that hypertension control is possible. Um, the Million Hearts champions across the nation are from many different health system delivery possibility. So it, it is possible in small towns, in federally qualified health centers, um, in academic health systems. So we know what works. Um, can you comment just about uh, lack of economic incentives for health systems and how this might play in as a barrier? And then I'm just gonna mention that Atlanta has launched the Atlanta Hypertension Initiative in partnership with the AMA, CDC, Million Hearts, eight hospitals and health systems of the Atlanta Regional Coalition for Health Improvement to improve hypertension control in our city where we live, especially in vulnerable populations. So um, thank you very much, Larry. And I'm glad you were on because I, I did want to highlight much of the work that you're doing. I always do whenever I see you. I think it's very important. Um, the financial levers may be a way to move the ball. It doesn't move me. I, I try to do what's right because that's our definition of being a clinician educator is to try to make an impact on the individual patient, the public health. But within a system, within a clinic setting, perhaps we can start to give some sort of financial reward if a cohort has for instance, as you would suggest, 80% of blood pressure is less than 140 over 90. My only concern is that we don't, again, penalize those uh, practices. We have the more difficult to treat patients. And we have, on the other hand, those silk stocking practices who can easily get 80% of the 140. We give them even more money. Um, the 15-minute visit bothers me. And those of you who are not working in an integrated health system and you don't uh, have close relationship with primary care. This is not a kind of a concept. This is a reality. They actually are knocking on doors and showing primary care clinicians their records saying they're not seeing enough patients. It's adverse then to what the prevent model is suggesting that we measure all of these various things, including the social determinants of health. And now you're saying do that, but do it in 15 minutes. So we need to struggle against that. I'm doing that here at Tulane. I spent several hours yesterday crafting emails to send throughout the system because uh, Tulane is now integrated with a, a system called LCMC and they, they are, they're trying to put us in that box. I'm not going to get in that box. Maybe it's because I'm at a stage in my career where I'm difficult to handle, but 
I would suggest even for my younger clinicians, you fight against this idea that you must spend 15 minutes with your patients. Financial incentives, yes. I think the thing that really works is empowering and educating people to not have the patient go to the doctor and he or she says, Ms. Brown, your blood pressure's a little high, your sugar's high, you need to lose some weight, see you in three months. The patient needs to understand the impact of these cardiovascular risks and needs to be motivated to do better in terms of adherence, but also needs to be motivated to challenge the clinician to do better and overcome therapeutic inertia. Therapeutic inertia is a primary concern with controlling risk factors. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So, uh, you know, majority of, we have a um, 10,000 women uh, prevention project that's led by Dr. Gina Lundberg. And basically, you know, the goal, is, we've screened about a thousand and the goal is to get to 10,000 where we go out into the community and provide not only screening education, but a follow-up phone call uh, at six weeks to see whether, you know, they uh, did what they were asked to do in terms of seeking care. So follow a phone call at six weeks and six months. And one of the things we find is that younger patients, you know, in their 30s and 35, uh, there's quite a bit of already elevated blood pressures, you know, over 135 or so. And so I wanted to hear your comments because it seems like majority of the people, you know, just don't go to see the doctor to even know that they have this. So what, you know, what can we do about that? Because I feel like, you know, by the time we see them, uh, you know, we're probably missing a majority of, for example, a lot of the younger women, you know, they go to see OBGYN and they may have, uh, you know, mildly elevated blood pressures, but it's always missed. So let me give you a brief stream of consciousness. I know we only have a few minutes and I could go on for a long time on that problem. One of the things we did with Healthy Heart from the beginning is that when we would go to do a project, we already had a list of primary care clinicians and community health centers, we would say, look, we're going to go to XYZ Baptist Church next week. We're doing a screening in the park. If we find something, will you be available to find a spot to take them? If it was a fairly qualified health center for a person who didn't have insurance, they knew that we were going to do this. We never would go in and do a risk factor evaluation and then tell the patient, your blood pressure is high, your sugar is high, you need to go see somebody. That, that to me, is a, is a misstep. The other thing is that along with any outreach and screening has to be education so that the patient understands the importance of what they've done. ACC Cardio Smart has wonderful handouts, infographics, one page, nice color. Million Hearts has wonderful handouts, one page, simple, easy to read. By educating the patients, then they understand what the, uh, the number is and the significance of the number, and then they will seek follow-up. But you have to have that that cadre of clinical services who are going to be built in. You probably can do that through zip code. You look for fairly qualified health centers, and then you look for members of American Heart, ACC, or American Society of Preventive Cardiology who are located in whatever area those people are located and say to them, look, we're doing this program. If we find something, can we refer them to you? Without that, it, it becomes a missing link. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we give them, you know, a list of uh, providers who are willing to see them. And we also do a lot of education. But, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, when we go out in the community and we do the screening, I'm just like, you're doing the screening. But it seems like a majority, you know, if you miss that, right, because you have certain number of people that we're going to see, but it just seems like there's a huge group that oh. just never makes it, you know, I, I got you. So the reason I'm smiling, because Mark Twain said, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> it is hard for young people to believe anything bad is going to happen to them. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I would do then is, along with talking about the numbers and the impact of the numbers, is perhaps discuss risk. Risk is a concept that most patients don't have, but when I talk to them, they get it. Uh, I see patients from all over the Southeast who will come to Tulane. And I'll usually ask them where you're from. They'll tell me what town. And I've traveled extensively, so I'm usually able to tell them where the end state is. If they came from Atlanta area, because a lot of people from New Orleans go to Atlanta and they came back. I said, you know, um, like if you're on 85 or 75 and you're trying to go where you need to go, you're going 60 miles an hour, and these boys come past you on a motorbike doing 110, that's very risky, even though they feel fine. 
most patients get that concept. Right. So sure. I would build into the concept of risk, um, long-term risk, lifetime risk, along with the education about the numbers and what the numbers mean. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ogany has a question. Um, did you want to unmute or? Yeah. Hello, Dr. Ferdinand. Thank you for your presentation. We all know the importance of SMBP and the role it plays in achieving blood pressure control. And we've done like a lot of work on the national scene trying to push that. But the major barrier I see is that blood pressure monitors, especially validated blood pressure monitors, one, is not recognized by health systems. I mean, I can speak about my health system. When we talked about validated blood pressure and started looking at blood pressure monitors that were handed out, they were not validated. The other issue is getting coverage. So we know that um, to check your blood glucose and I could check machine or whatever brand it is, is a durable medical equipment. It's branded as that. But we've, at the national level, we've tried to get blood pressure monitors recognized as DMEs, and that also is impacting coverage. What are your thoughts on that? Well, what you say is totally accurate. Um, I'll give you some history because I was on the uh, Joint National Committee that had the reports that NIH had and NHLBI before ACCHA had the guidelines. And we actually used the term therapeutic lifestyle changes, TLC. And that was because we wanted to get reimbursement for self-monitored blood pressure similar to what was done in glucose for diabetes. And it's kind of fallen away. I'm not sure why it's been so difficult. Some health systems will pay for a valid monitor. And there are some ways now where you can integrate the home blood pressure into EPIC or whatever electronic health record you have. Here at Tulane, we don't integrate into EPIC. It's something that I do based on my community uh, interventions. But hopefully in the future, that can be done. Uh, you also can look at programs like Million Hearts, CDC. They're pushing to try to get a reimbursement and some insurances, private insurances, and even some governmental Medicaid insurances, if you have the right codes, will get the person a valid device. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Andy Smith has a question. Yeah, I have a question about ACE inhibitors and <clears throat> ARB therapy. I know in the heart failure world, uh, these medicines are considered equivalent as far as their benefit, but there's certainly increased side effects with ACE inhibitors with cough uh, and also angioedema. Um, in the hypertension world, what's the situation there? And if cost uh, is not an issue in prescribing, should we be uh, prescribing ARBs uh, before we prescribe ACE inhibitors? So Cochrane analysis suggests that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are similar across large populations in terms of blood pressure lowering effect. The bradykinin stimulation that you see with an ACE inhibitor, you won't see with an ARB. Angioedema has been very rarely reported with an ARB. Uh, it's one out of a thousand in the black population with an ACE inhibitor. Rick, uh, Ron Victor in the Los Angeles Barbershop study started with herbosartan. I tend to use more ARBs for conventional hypertension than I do ACE inhibitors because they have similar blood pressure lowering and you avoid the cough 10% and you avoid the rare angioedema. And I, I think the, the outcomes have been very good with it. The FDA now says that if you have a valid long acting blood pressure medication in the package insert, they'll, they'll mention that lowering blood pressure has been shown to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, and they really don't cut it that thin. Now, there is some language in the insert for some of the early ARBs like Losartan, and that's related to the studies where the blood pressure lowering benefit and the, the benefit in terms of reducing cardiovascular events was not seen as much in the Black population. I think that's because of more obesity, more cell sensitivity, the need to combine with the and they, excuse me, combine it with a diuretic or long-acting calcium channel blocker. So if you're doing a two-drug regimen, the ARB calcium channel blocker will be just as effective as anything else. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, Chandan Devreddy has a question. 
May I, Dr. Ferdinand, can you uh, hear me? Yes. Hey, thank you so much for such an excellent presentation uh, talking about, you know, just the real, if you think about it, 3D or 4D view of hypertension and all the things involved. We've been integrally involved in the study of renal denervation here at Emory. And earlier in your talk, you had shown the, the sub-study, you know, asking the question, is renal denervation appropriate or effective in the African-American or other <clears throat> underrepresented minority populations. In our experience, it was interesting. We, we had you know, patients that would come in and, and sometimes it was a question instead of does getting these patients plugged into the healthcare system just work that well in the placebo group? And one of my fears is you know, we have a lot left to learn in renal denervation, but if the therapy does prove to be an effective adjunct for some group of patients, will we see the same disparities play out in you know, underrepresented minority patients not getting access to this therapy? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, access to new therapies is a huge problem of the, uh, the mortality across social demographic populations. We, we come up with new medicines and, and new devices and interventions. You can do the same for Tavar, Mitraclip. You, you, you pick your poison and you'll see these type of disparities. It's probably related to insurance status and the type of insurance. Some insurances just have more rigorous prior authorization. I think the reason the early study with the simplicity catheter didn't show as much of an effect in the black population wasn't that it was less effective in that population, but it was the placebo effect, the Hawthorne effect, where patients get in the study, they're given a lot of love and attention and increase their medications and their adherence to medicines. So you blunt the difference of the device versus the sham. So I, I really wouldn't see any reason why that particular approach wouldn't be effective. Remember, you're not gonna remove all the medicines and these patients sometimes on four or five medicines, you may be able to decrease the uh, blood pressure five to 10 millimeters of mercury, perhaps remove one or two medicines, but there's nothing wrong with medicines. The American population has gotten this adverse view against uh, pharmacotherapy and I, I just think it's the, the bad way to go. Those of you like Peter Block, I saw his name on there, who've been around for a while, know that it used to be placebo-controlled trials with hypertension. The VA cooperative trial in the 1960s with Ed Fries with a systolic blood pressure in the 160s. After two years, half the people in placebo had heart attack, strokes, or were dead. So um, medicines work. Renal generation may help simplify therapy, increase adherence because it's, it's turned on. It may decrease nocturnal blood pressure because it's 24 hours, but it's not going to remove the need for a pharmacotherapy. Great, thank you. Uh, did Dr. Uh, Peter Block have a question? No, yeah, I just saw his name. <laughs> hey, Keith, it's nice to hear your voice. All right. Uh, thanks for mentioning my name. I didn't realize I'd been around that long. In any case, <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith, going back to the renal denervation business, everyone sort of was hoping uh, that that would be the magic bullet and all the medications could go away and so forth. Obviously, that's not the case. But just practically speaking, today and looking for what we now know, how do you use that in your therapeutic strategy? Well, you know, it just was approved. It was investigational prior to that. What I'm probably going to do is first uh, make sure that the patient's on the appropriate regimen. And if the blood pressure is still significantly elevated, I'm going to offer it as a choice, but I'm not going to give them the promise that you're going to get off all the medicines. Fair enough. I, you know, I think uh, as I've looked at this, everyone keeps hoping it's going to work a little bit better than so far. It seems to be actually working, but sooner or later, someone's going to come up with something. But for now, I think it's, one of those issues, as you point out, let's see what we can do first. And then if it doesn't work, give that a shot. But it's relatively expensive and probably is not, at this point anyway, going to make a huge difference. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. And then we'll have our last question here um, from Dr. Magorisk. Uh, I, I can read it. Um, what about hydrochlorothiazide is first line in African-Americans? and increased uh, glucose uh, intolerance. Would you comment on that? Well, hydrochlorothiazide is clearly effective. Uh, the increase in glucose uh, is a consideration, but I don't think that that's as powerful as blood pressure. If you go back to the modifiable risk factors, glucose really 
doesn't have the same effect in terms of reducing cardiovascular morbidity and mortality by approaching glucose. And in fact, most persons with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, 80% of them have hypertension and most of them die from heart failure, heart attacks, or strokes. So I still see the blood pressure as the main biomarker that we need to control. It's similar with the statins. You see a small increase in insulin resistance and glucose with statins, but it overwhelms the benefit of lowering LDL cholesterol. So glucose has gotten a long way. Um, reimbursement for the durable devices, reimbursement for diabetes education. We need to start doing the same for hypertension, which is the most potent and prevalent risk factor. I think that's my take home, that uh, we need to do more to keep that emphasis on hypertension, similar to what we've done with diabetes. Not, not against it, not superior to it, but clearly something that's that's more prevalent and more potent. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferdinand, again, for an excellent presentation. We learned a lot, and we really appreciate the time and also the fact that you had to get up so early to, <laughs> to give this talk. So thank you. It's all right. I, I, I treasure my, my colleagues and friends at Emory, and I'm glad to be able to speak to you today. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.